Amazing. Awesome. So yes, thank you everybody for joining. Um, it's Nadir Pearson here, founder of SMART, um, for our New Jersey Cannabis Legalization Webinar. Um, we have some amazing speakers today. We have an amazing moderator who's going to be leading the way in Josh Alb. Um, and so just wanted to say hi and, you know, very exciting times, you know, for the cannabis space. The sector is definitely heating up. 2019, we had a bit of a lull. You've seen stocks dying. 2020 was pandemic time. We were deemed an essential business, right? Um, and 2021 is now here and we got New Jersey passing legalization um, laws as well as New York right on our tail. Um, again, we just said that they they cannot just see us winning. They can't see New Jersey thriving without having to do something. So um, really excited to get into this discussion today. Um, I'm gonna let Josh pass it over to him. Um, shout out the Canademics team, shout out Why Not THC um, to give us some more detailed uh, explanation as to what's going on here um, and what we're gonna be talking about today. And also wanna give a big shout out to Danny Grodberg, Jenna M, um, and the whole Stockton Smart team for inspiring this webinar today. Um, so big kudos to our student leaders who are again leading. So Joshua, if you wanna go ahead. Hey man, thank you so much Nadir for having me here. You know, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you Danny and the rest of the Stockton Smart team for putting this together, you know, especially during the, these times that we're having, you know, and, and shout out again, to everyone getting their vaccine, you know. Um, you know, uh, we're going to go along with uh, with we have for this agenda here. So a little bit about myself, you know, I'm from Edison, New Jersey, born and raised pretty much, you know, um, so Jersey native, Jersey blood. Um, you know, my initial interest in this industry was really like cannabinoids and a lot of the science end of stuff. So I spent some time out west learning that and came back here, got into a lot of research, got into a lot of the science with it academically, at least, and a little bit clinically. And, uh, you know, founded uh, two separate companies, Canademics and Why Not THC, both are science advocacy and really for uh, education you know education is one of the biggest achilles heels i feel within this industry you know it's one of the biggest achilles heel in america um and that is really why we're here today we want to be able to educate you guys we want to keep you informed about what's going on you know it's important because there's so many questions so many things up in the air you know and there's a lot that we don't know yet um but honestly the people to get the information from the best of the three people or four people sitting next to me in my screen right here you know to heed Chappelle, uh, Jessica Gonzalez, my man Evan, and of course not dear. Okay, so you know, without further ado, you know, Tahid, my man. Okay, because I see you're in the you're in the direct screen next to me. You know, uh, I want to like uh, I want to introduce you first. He's the founder of Can the Can Atlantic Conference. This man is verified on Instagram and Twitter. Okay, he is serious. All right, he is no one to play with. All right. You know, so to heed, you know, without further ado, I'd like you to introduce yourself. Tell everybody a little bit about yourself, my man. Oh, goodness. The check marks. Oh, my gosh. Thanks. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Tahid Chappelle, uh, pronouns he, him. Um, uh, originally born and raised in Camden County, uh, New Jersey, and I'm actually back in Jersey um, due to pandemic reasons and whatnot. But um, here in Jersey, I'm a cannabis journalist. I'm a cannabis educator. A cannabis activist. Um, Josh hit the nail on the head. I'm all about education and making sure that people really understand what legalization means and the impact it has on different communities. Um, my background, I've also, I'm also a, a cannabis patient. I suffer from an autoimmune deficiency disorder called ulcerative colitis and cannabis helps with that. Uh, I lived in Arizona, California, DC, and most recently Pennsylvania. So I've been in very different, very different cannabis markets from the West Coast to the East Coast. And I've had a whole bit of whole bunch of different insight on what's working and what's not. So uh, very excited to be here. Very excited to talk about New Jersey. And uh, thank you for having me here. Appreciate it. And thanks for coming on. All right. The next person to my right is Evan, my brother, Evan Neeson. He's the founder of NJ Normal and Neeson and COVID. Let me tell you something. This man's done a lot, you know, help organize protests over here for the legalization for the medical side. He's worked uh, with the executive side with, you know, normal there's so much to do, man. He told me to keep it short, though, okay? But without further ado, Evan, man, I want you to introduce yourself to the room, my, my man. Thank you. Um, my name's Evan Nissen. Uh, I'm currently in East Brunswick. Usually I'm in Saraville, but I'm letting my apartment, uh, you know, similarly, I'm, I'm moving, I'm in a different place because of the pandemic. I'm letting my apartment to someone. Um, I'm the vice chair of Normal National and on the board of uh, Students for Sensible Drug Policy, the national board. I'm also, as you mentioned, uh, helping revitalize Normal New Jersey here. Um, and then uh, on the business side, I consider myself a social entrepreneur. So I have a socially benef what I try to make socially beneficial businesses. 
Um, one is a cannabis, cannabis focused PR firm. Um, we employ about 20 people. Um, I think we're the largest cannabis specific, at least the cannabis specific PR firms. Um, I have two smoke and vape shops in New Jersey, which I uh, started with somebody uh, in New Jersey who was incarcerated for cannabis for about a year. Um, and I have a cannabis tour company that I uh, started with a friend out in California, um, where we help give the public uh, sort of a, a, a front row seat to every level of the industry from like seat to sale. That's incredible, my man. That's incredible. Now I got to introduce the best for last, the powerhouse in New Jersey, Miss Jessica Gonzalez, the, attorney, the cannabis attorney from Bresler, Amy Ross and PC. How you doing, Jessica? How you doing today? Oh, very happy to be here with everybody and my pals. Um, so welcome everybody. I'm Jess Gonzalez. Um, I'm a cannabis attorney in New Jersey. I'm also outside general counsel for Minorities for Medical Marijuana. I sit on the policy committee for the Minority Cannabis Business Association. I was part of NJ Can as well, which um, as we all know, really helped lead the most successful cannabis campaign in the country. Um, I advocated and testified and actually brought on a whole bunch of folks who are on here now with me to testify for social equity initiatives um, as well. I wear a couple of different hats um, in the space, but very excited to be here today. Thank you, thank you so much. Now, you know, we got our questions here that I wanna start getting over with everyone. So we can start <clears throat> about legalization, what's going on, decriminalization, everything. So. You know, Jess, I kind of wanted to ask you first, man, what do you see as the wins? What's going on? What happened? Okay. A21, S21, bills with letters and numbers. What happened, man? We, we need to know. Uh, right. So um, for folks um, who are very, you know, well attuned to what happened, you know, on November 3rd, we had a 60, about 67% turnout um, in terms of those favoring um, adult use legalization. Cannabis won in every single county in New Jersey, deeming this the most successful cannabis campaign in the country. And so what ended up, you know, what happening was right after that, um, a few days later, the bill was introduced, um, which was A21S21, um, with a committee hearing that Monday, right? So that didn't really give many uh, folks that much time to prepare. It did, you know, take a while to get there, um, but eventually there were compromises really on both sides of the aisle. Um, and so in December, it passed both the Senate and the Assembly, and then Governor Murphy uh, signed it into law February 22nd, 2021. And so he signed into law three different laws. Um, one was the adult use legalization for personal use for adults over the age of 21. It also deschedules um, cannabis as well in New Jersey. Then we also had the decriminalization bill as well, which um, uh, decrimed um, six ounces or less as well, and also put down a couple of other penalties. And then we also really had a cleanup bill um, as well that a couple of folks were, were kind of confused about, um, but that basically had to really clarify a lot of the provisions for juveniles getting caught um, with cannabis possession. But what it also did was it kind of made it clear the difference between with cannabis and marijuana. Um, and so New Jersey is really the only state in the country that has actually delineated that sort of verbiage. In, where in, in terms of cannabis, you know, equals weed that you get from a dispensary and uh, marijuana is weed that you do not get from a legal dispensary. So for folks who are asking, why did we have to have a decriminalization bill? Because the decriminalization bill decriminalizes marijuana, the legalization bill legalizes cannabis. Um, and so I would say that for folks, you know, who are in, out there in other states to really um, ensure that that sort of delineation does not happen um, again. But basically kind of right now where we are is the adult use bill um, is basically gonna create a regulatory framework, right? We're gonna have six different classes of licenses ranging from you know cultivation to delivery. We're also going to be having, which I think we'll get into more discussion later, um, but basically that's what it's gonna do, right? We have now a commission that I think as of yesterday, I don't think it's been a formally officially formed, but now all five members have been um, appointed as well. And the moment that it's officially formed, that's when a lot of the timelines are going to kick in into when licenses are going to be put forth, when regulations are going to be put forth. So that's where we're at as of today. Okay. So Tahid, I got to ask you something. We've gone over these bills and as someone who's, who spent a lot of time growing the plant, I used to work as a horticulturist running a, you know, a, about an acre long farm of, you know, what would be deemed as cannabis, you know, because we were selling to legal dispensaries, you know, how does, how does this wording play? Because you and I both know marijuana is, has a, some pretty racist roots. The fact that, you know, the, the disproportionate of the, the color industry all of a sudden now 
we're looking at this. So what can you say? You know, we're looking at, you know, do we still have work to do? You know what I mean? Is there still work? Yeah. Um, you know, Jess, correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like lawyers are probably going to be really busy because of the delineation between marijuana and cannabis. They are the same thing. Um, for, for some background, I recently came back to Jersey from Pennsylvania uh, after, you know, working a lot in Pennsylvania and looking at the policy there. And when I got here before November, when I saw the question, I was, I was actually like kind of shocked. I was like, wait a second. Like there's a, there's a literal like difference between the same plant, but one, you can still be um, incarcerated for at this point, And one, you can actually legally possess and, you know, build a business around. Um, I, I think, I think we have to, we have a lot of work to do just, just to get to the point, Josh, like a lot of our, uh, the panelists are going to talk a lot about the work that we need to do, but I think there's going to have to be some effort to clarify the language around marijuana. I think we need, I need, I think we're going to need to talk about making sure that other States have li literally ensured that marijuana is in their build so that no one is actually harmed for marijuana. The, the difference between cannabis and marijuana is going to be huge. And I think that, um, you know, as police officers are training for the new legal market, they're still going to have opportunities uh, to continue to harm people who are using the plant um, for their own personal reasons. Yeah, man, police training for, you know, to apprehension and education, all that stuff they're claiming they need money for, you know, it just sounds like a whole bunch of BS in my opinion, you know what I mean? Like they have overinflated budgets already here in New Jersey, and it's just like incredible that even tax dollars has to be devoted to them. But you know, we're looking at all this stuff as more of a ripple effect, you know, New Jersey getting legalized as a ripple effect of really California, you know, and the Prop 215 days flourishing into this industry that we know now, you know, so I really want to talk to, to Evan about this, you know, how does this affect anything moving forward, at least federally, where could you see New Jersey and, and what's happening here in this state? Um, you know, how does that apply to the larger scale now, this ripple effect, you know? Well, the ripple effect is already showing itself in New York. Um, regionally, it's going to be really, really difficult for states around us to not legalize cannabis. You know, I see John, uh, I think his last name is Fetterman, uh, who's a normal pack also endorsed in Pennsylvania, talking about how New Jersey has legalized cannabis, I think, every single day since we did on his Facebook page, um, who's a lieutenant governor uh, in, of Pennsylvania. Um, so that is going to have a ripple on the federal landscape because New Jersey is obviously big, New York's big. We also come with a lot of federal legislators. I mean, we also produced Cory Booker. Um, and I think part of the reason that he was, he is able to be so uh, vocal on the national level. Uh, I mean, frankly, I think he would, regardless of political support because of uh, who he is, um, but, but he's able to do that and keep winning election because New Jersey supports this. Um, so New Jersey passing this, especially because we have been perceived to be such a harsh state on cannabis, I think is really pushing the bounds. Uh, and the fact that we had a fairly progressive law, even though there's a lot to change, um, mm -hmm. uh, I think is part of the reason that New York uh, is trying to maybe out progressive us also. You know, started a trend <laughs> that, that I think. Up, right now, you're always trying to one up us, man. <laughs> I, I actually am happy. I want that. You know, I, 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 you know, from a national standpoint, I want everyone to have good, as, as good cannabis laws as possible. So if, if we get in a competition, uh, across borders about who can have the most progressive cannabis law. I'm totally fine with that. Hey, man, I love the sound <laughs> of it. You know, so we know that this law is in place now, right? And everything's been voted. So, you know, Jess, everyone, you know, can you chime in? What are what are our rights? Like, what's what's applied now? How is it applied? How does it translate to our individual rights, you know? Um, so I'll start it off. So in terms of, you know, individual rights, um, you know, so under the adult use bill, you can have up to six ounces um, of cannabis on you, smell is no longer probable cause, um, you know, as well. However, you know, I would caution folks, right, um, to, there's still going to be laws in terms of where you can consume and where you can't consume. And so I know that that's a lot, a big question for folks as to where can they, um, but, you know, right now it's right, it's kind of like, look at it as like open container laws, right, like with alcohol, you can't just really be like walking around outside, you know, um, drinking a Bud Light, um, it's kind of going to be the same thing, and especially the way that ordinances are going to be put forth um, with municipalities, we're going to have to pay very, very close attention to, um, but, you know, your landlord, if you're renting a place, they can definitely, what they can do is they can 
prohibit you from the smoking, vaping, or aerosoling of cannabis, but they can't actually prohibit you from possession of it or ingesting it um, as well. So tinctures, edibles, none of, that, none of that can be banned, but the smoking, vaping absolutely can be. Obviously, if you own your own house, that's really, you know, no issue. Um, and so, you know, I think that this problem in terms of, you know, where people can consume, especially if you're renting, and also, you know, if you're in um, you know, certain Section 8 housing um, as well, there are still um, prohibitions against that um, as well because it is tied to federal funding. Um, and so it is really important for folks to really understand what their rights are, but also, you know, to because of the fact that we don't have adult use sales yet, if you are caught with it and you are not a patient, um, your medicine can still be confiscated um, by police, right? It probably may just be, you know, a ticket here or there. Um, you can't, you're not going to actually get, you know, arrested if you're on under the legal limit, um, but because there is no presumption just yet that you acquired it legally unless you show your medical card. So just wanted to put that out there for folks who are maybe wondering kind of what they can and cannot do. Mm, you know, and, and that kind of leads me to a bigger question. We've talked about the difference between cannabis and marijuana, you know, so Tahid, I really got to ask you this question, you know, do you, this, this, this difference here, have you seen any kind of language like it? And could that also affect what Jessica's talking about when people, you know, even when people, it's legal now, you know, say you're out smoking or something, you don't have a receipt from the dispensary. So are they going to, could they classify that as marijuana, even though it might be a lot of something that you obtained or you with a group of people that's obtained a lot of cannabis, you know, you guys got a couple, each one, of you got a couple ounces from a dispensary, you got like half a pound in the room or something like that. And all of a sudden now they're saying, oh, you don't have receipts. You can't prove that this isn't marijuana. You know what I mean? Yeah. One thing, um, one thing I really wanted to, to dovetail off of what Jess was saying too, is that you cannot grow cannabis still. Like for anyone who's watching this, you can't grow cannabis in New Jersey. So don't think that, oh, it's legal. Like I can, I'm still like I'm protected or I'm immune from growing my own. That is, in, in my opinion, that's going to be marijuana. That is marijuana, y'all. If you are growing your own weed, it is now, in my opinion, could be deemed marijuana because it is not through the legal process. It is not through the legal business. And there is no language that kind of says, um, one, home grow is decriminalized or two, home grow is legal for anyone to grow. Um, I think that's like a glaring opportunity when we're talking about advocating. Um, but I, I, would, I would say that, you know, again, when we're talking about the, the difference between marijuana and cannabis, I'm worried that cops will use, you know, a lot of other ways to describe the same plant that you can get if you're a medical marijuana patient at this point. So please do not grow cannabis. Please don't try to grow it right now. Um, and wait until I think more activists and advocates get together to push for home grow to make sure that you're safe to do that. Yeah, man. So Evan, is this happening right now? Anything home grow related happening? Yeah, and also the home grow laws are untouched. So they're still very, very harsh. Um, it's not just that you're uh, committing a crime. You know, I think most of us may have been okay with doing that. Um, this is a, a, a crime that comes with serious punishments that I really you know, want to stress, like, do not do. Unfortunately, I wish we all could, because I really want to, but I really don't want to see people go to jail, like prison for cannabis, uh, for marijuana, um, for the for weed <laughs> um, in New Jersey. <laughs> I've just been called, I, I never called it weed until this, because now I don't know what else to call. That's the, 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 the language. <laughs> the language is so important. You're right. Yeah, um, this is absolutely ridiculous with this language, you know, and then it, it plays in, you know, and we've talked a little bit about that. But so this licensing right now that this is in play, you know, we're going to be quick, licensed for Canada, I just want, not Maryland, John, right? What's up? What's up? Oh, I just want to answer your question because I didn't actually answer it. There is going to be legislative action to try to decriminalize and legalize home grow. It is important that everyone keep an eye out for that because we're going to need everyone to email their legislators. So that's the only reason why I wanted to make sure to answer that. And as of, as of now, there's about three different homegirl bills. I think it's either two or three. I know one is specifically for patients. The other one is for, you know, adult use. And I think the other one is a mix of it, perhaps, I think. There's a lot going on at the moment, but um, it's definitely something I, I would um, definitely reiterate what Evan said, um, that this is still something that um, we are advocating for and fighting for. And so the fact that it is pending and it, they, these bills came pretty quickly, um, you know, after uh, there was movement on the adult use bill. So just goes 
to show that sometimes um, we do have to have a foundation to really start upon. Um, and as, as we get talking to licenses, it's kind of what um, I will be really harping on is the fact that we now have a foundation to build upon. We're no longer talking in hypotheticals. We're not talking in theoreticals anymore. Um, so we can't always let sort of perfect be the enemy of the good when it comes to this. Because I know that there were folks who were like, homegirl or nothing at all. Right. Um, but not realizing that there is a chain of events that really will will come down from this. Yeah. You know, um, and a lot of the at least the black end, it just seems like a lot of this was kind of more of a money grab for them not to allow homegrown. You know, it's definitely an MSO move, a larger corporation move. So, you know, and that kind of plays into this whole licensing that we're talking about right now. Right. You know, like people's ability to get licenses, what kind of licenses are going to be available. So, yeah. What kind of licenses are going to be available? You know, because you guys explain that a little bit. I'll start off. Um, so we're going to have six different types of classes of licenses. So it'll go cultivation, processing, wholesale, distribution, retail that comes with a consumption lounge. You can apply for a permit on that and delivery um, as well. And I think probably one of the best moves there was putting the consumption lounge for the reason that I spoke about earlier about the fact that there are people who are not going to have um, a place to safely consume. Um, and so consumption lounges will really provide that. I think it's part of the social and health equity movement um, as well. But we are also going to have micro licenses. Um, and I think if you would have asked me about two or three months ago, if micro licenses were the way to go, I probably would have dissuaded you from it or just tried my best to educate you on it because I didn't feel that the mechanisms were actually financially viable. However, um, I was able to testify and advocate enough such that now micro licenses after one year are able to transform and able to become full scale licenses. So all the restrictions of micro licenses will go away. But at the moment we have it where 10% of each type of license and at least 25% of all licenses awarded have to be micro licenses. Where this comes, and it's really important, is we have a 37 cultivation license cap for the first two years. That timeline started on February 22nd. Micro licenses are not a part of that cap. So micro cultivation licenses are definitely still up for grabs. The full scale ones are definitely going to by far be the most competitive because that 37 cap number isn't that there's 37 available. That encompasses the 12 operators that we have now. It encompasses the four verticals in the 2019 RFA and the five standalone cultivation licenses in the 2019 RFA. Mm -hmm. um, but aside from micro licenses, which we can talk about later, is we're also going to have conditional licenses as well. And this, I think, is sort of a less sort of well-known type of model, but it's essentially, you know, if you were to have about 75, 80% of your application completed, but you can't really lock down your site control, then you can apply for one of these conditional licenses if subject to certain salary requirements that, you're, that you have to be under. And then the commissions will say, okay, here's a provisional license and we're gonna give you 120 days to perfect your license and then you'll actually get the license. Um, so I think that's gonna be a good entryway for folks as well who either may say, I don't have all the capital, you know, I don't have my experience partner or I don't have um, you know, my, my site control or real estate locked down yet as well. Um, and then um, those are kind of the other two kind of subtype of um, licenses as well. Um, but there are certain various provisions, um, including testing um, as well, and certain sort of um, academic type of sort of permit license types um, as well. So there's definitely a good amount in there, but I would say New Jersey did very well by adding the consumption lounge that kind of goes along with the, uh, the retail license. Yeah, that does go a long way, you know, and, um, you know, what, what, who's qualified, like, what are qualifications for applying like, for these licenses, you know, is, is there any like one standard thing, like you need a degree in X, Y, or Z, or, you know, like, what, what, what's that about? Anyone? I'm going to start it off and just say, make sure you have money. Because for those who are thinking of, of trying to go for the license, I don't think people know how much money you're going to need, or at least have in reserve to go through the process, because the process is the expensive part. Just getting the license is going to cost money, but the process of, and Evan and Jess can talk about this more, but really the process is, is expensive. Um, and what I really uh, liked about the conditional license is that um, Jess mentioned, that's a good opportunity to make your entry point if you don't have everything ready if you don't even know how everything set, that's a good entry point into trying to getting the license as well. And I wanted to mention, um, you know, you, there, there is a uh, limitation on the conditional license. You, you can't make more than $200,000, but 
individually or combined $400,000 too. Not, I mean, if you're making that much money, good for you, but like, just know that there are the devil's in the details. There are restrictions on who actually is, uh, you know, able to get those licenses too, but um, I'll kick it to Evan and Jess though for, for some comments. One thing I just want to say is if you have a criminal background, doesn't mean you should not apply. Um, that's one of the good things in New Jersey's law. You know, if you've gotten arrested, I don't know every single detail, just mean if there are limitations, but I know that the vast majority of uh, criminal convictions, you can still get a license for. So, um, you know, if you were part of the illicit market, if you're part of the illicit market, please come join, you know, because you're less likely to get arrested, you're more likely to make more money. Um, but, you know, I also echo make sure uh, that it's done properly. Uh, you have enough capital, because if you don't have the right runway, you could, you know, die before takeoff, sort of, so to speak, crash before takeoff. Um, and I've also advised people, you know, the first round seems to be uh, what most people are excited about. Um, but the first round applicants is usually who gets burned too. Um, you know, you could join the industry in, in five years and take significantly less risk um, than right now. Yeah, and then for, for folks who are kind of like, well, what am I going to need to get started? It's all in the, the, uh, the adult use bill. Um, so the sort of baseline requirements are all in there. There's like sections, one on cultivation, one on processing, that it'll really outline, you know, what you're going to need. But for folks who are really serious about this, I would also look at the 2019 request for applications. That's still available um, on the, the Department of Health's website. So you can see all the requirements and how they graded um, in the last sort of round and the certain points that they're allocating to, because that's going to really dictate how you move. So kind of take from the 2019 RFA requirements look at the current bill. I know it's like 220 pages, but control F is your best friend. So just control F cultivation until you get to the spot, um, you know, where you need to be. And it'll lay out, right, your type of summary, you know, your operating plan, what type, what does site control really mean, right? What are you going to need for all these types of things? Um, and so I think, you know, it's really important that folks educate themselves um, immensely on what it's going to take, because I think there's this assumption like it's here um, and we're just gonna be able to apply, you know, like we want a liquor store or anything like that. But we have to realize that New Jersey is a hyper competitive industry, cannabis industry. Um, it's gonna be a hyper regulated cannabis industry um, as well. So this isn't going to be like other industries that we've seen either in the Midwest or on the West Coast where they don't have more competitive licensing schemes. They have kind of, you know, first come first serve or, you know, you just kind of check over boxes. Most likely, at least the way that it is written right now, it is going to be a competitive based sort of model. So you're going to be scored against folks who are going to have the capital, who are going to have the experience, who are going to have everything locked down already. Um, and while we don't really have an accurate timeline as to when these licenses are going to drop, I would still say that time is of the essence um, and that it is really important to really start getting started now um, on just educating yourself, making those sort of um, relationships with the communities as well, because municipalities are starting already to ban cannabis licenses or cannabis operations. So if you're going to put all your eggs in one basket in one municipality and they're kind of like 50-50 right now, you're going to need a sort of backup plan for that um, because um, until these ordinances are actually put through, we're not really going to know how these municipalities are going to move. They have until about August 22nd to do so. So they're moving quickly. That's great. That's crazy. You know, that, that this timeline seems like, you know, it's, it's really sped up. Um, and of course, now with New York legalizing, I think it might speed up even faster, you know, and that's what um, at least it's looking like. Um, so what's the cost of applying, though? That, that's, that's a question, I guess, is it might be on everyone's mind. How much money do I need? How much money do I need? Man, I got I got 20 G's in the bank. Is that enough? You know, like how much money do you need? So 20 G's, if you have 20 G's, that'll cover the application fee. Um, because at least historically, that's what it's been. We don't know what it will be for a micro license, whatever the application will be, it will be half of that. Um, but, you know, regardless, I'd say depending on the type of license, that cost is going to vary and how much of a heavy lifting you can do. Um, but I would never budget anywhere less than like anywhere like under 150. I would say anywhere from 150 to 250, depending on the type of application to really try to budget because 
not just legal services. It's your consulting services and your, you know, your site control um, and your architect um, as well. Um, it's good. It's it's a huge substantial, and so I think the barriers to entry right now. But I think you know, piggybacking off what what Evan said, right, is this is just the first round, um, and so there's no really. If you can't get into it now, like people really shouldn't have FOMO about it. Um, this is an industry that is going to continue to evolve. We're not. I haven't even scraped the surface just yet. I I I hope everyone really takes that because that's going to really save a lot of people a serious like amount of cash, um, especially a lot of times the people you know, who are most excited uh, and least experienced and have, uh, they can't afford to lose anything, will jump in first. Um, and also, uh, so what Jess was talking about was the application to get the license and get up and, go, up and running. Um, yeah, as a business owner, I can tell you, especially of smoke shops and vape shops in New Jersey, you're not going to be profitable right away. <laughs> um, even in this industry, almost for sure, you should prepare to lose money as like operate while you're operating for the first year. Um, hopefully you won't, that doesn't always happen, you know, uh, but oftentimes uh, you will not become, you know, you'll, you'll lose $15,000 a month and $13,000 a month and 10,000. And then eventually you'll start making profit. Um, and all of that should be incorporated too. Um, most business advisors will tell you to have at least a year's worth of business expenses. So figure out what your rent, your employees, uh, your insurance costs are, um, lawyers for compliance, every expense you could possibly think of, put on an Excel sheet, figure out what that is a month, multiply that by 12, and you should have that in addition to what Jess said, in my opinion. I've heard in Pennsylvania, $2 million, some people have said. If you want to have some good foundation money for all the hiccups that you're going to run into, $2 million would be a good thing to have. I'll say, um, you know, like to share my experience, a smoke shop took about $110,000 before it became profitable. You know, it cost us $0 to acquire the license because there is, no, you know, I mean, maybe a few hundred bucks. Um, and we don't have to pay for compliance or anything like that a dispensary is going to have to pay. We have, you know, a $15 an hour person behind the, behind the, the, ta the table and that's it. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Two million. So two million. If folks are wondering, like, why are you know cannabis operators not profitable when you see these numbers coming out, you're like, ah, you know, Colorado passed a billion, and Massachusetts did this in their first week. Um, it is the uh, the the IRS tax code 280E. That if you don't understand what 280E is, um, then I highly recommend that you look that up because essentially. What you end up operating at is at about like a sort of 50 to 70 percent tax rate based on, you know, what I've um, spoken to with accountants that we work with. Um, so if you can imagine that enormous amount of money because you can't deduct your regular business expenses. And so even if you are moving forward with your you know, financial planning um, and when you're applying for a license and you have to put forth these sort of financial plans, you got to make sure that the 280E is taken into consideration, which is why it's important that you work with an accountant who is well-versed in cannabis and who can actually give you an accurate model. Oh, that's a great point, you know, and uh, I know that uh, you probably know those people, the, the people to go to for that, right, Jess? You know, any type of cannabis, you know any cannabis accounts that are good? Yeah. Yeah. I sure do. Yeah. So that, that right there, you know, you need a cannabis accountant, see Jess too. She might have one for you, you know, so I want to say though, to he two million. You think two million is the number though? Two million. I mean, go? that that was just because in Pennsylvania the application for a medical uh, license was ex like astronomically high. So you were already having to put out hundreds of thousands just for uh, the the chance. Listen, you're you're just paying for the chance to get the license. You're not even guaranteed the license. So um, you know, I, because there's so much money involved in that, and and really raising capital. Um, is going to be difficult with competition. Um, it, it, you know, I, I would always say to, and that has been echoed here on the panel, is to look and start reading on seeing what other markets have been doing. What can you learn from other markets? How did other markets come to operation? How did other people start up? Um, because New Jersey's, you know, language, you know, while tailored to the state, does pull and have them have some influence from other markets too. So. You know, in, in my opinion, while while the Cannabis Regulatory Commission is just trying to get itself together, you know, this first year or two, I would say do the research. Like this year, dedicate your time to research so that you can start getting your 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 I's dotted, your T's crossed, and you can start kind of understanding how much money you're going to need 
for this particular market. No, 100%, you know, 100%. So, you know, then it, that gets into really the the big question, you know, what's the what's the current status of the market? What's our timeline looking like at this point now? You know, it's a big question that, that's on everyone's mind. You know, Evan, Evan, you want to start off with that one? Yeah, I honestly think I'm probably, my, I, I would have faith in the other panelists. Yes, um, yes, take yes it more. But, but I do want to just say one of the things I want to point out before I let somebody else answer um, is that the medical dispensaries are allowed to start selling to recreational consumers once they can certify uh, they have enough supply to meet the patient demand. So I assume that that will probably be the first sales that happen. You know, people, not everyone on this call, my guess, my guess is that not everyone on this uh, call that's participating will be able to get that. It's probably going to be difficult to get an appointment, but that's probably when the sales, uh, that's probably uh, that will probably be the first sales. And my best guess is that will be in the next six months um, in terms of the actual licenses and uh, business side, you know, that I'll pass on. I think in terms of like when licenses will be available, I think that that, that it's like, you know, uh, we got to be expert tea leaf readers, right? Um, to try to see when, because the commission still, you know, hasn't really been a officially officially formed just yet um and so what ends going to end up happening is they have to form they have to put forth their staffing um but also then we have to put forth regulations and these regulations are going to be subject to public comment period so i encourage everybody on this call to please participate in these public comment periods because if there is a specific license you want to go for or a specific business opportunity this is really going to be your chance to let you know the commission uh know what you need what what resources do you need what is blocking you from getting to where you need to be you're going to understand your business and your business needs a lot better um, because you're going to be so ingrained in it so that public comment period is going to take place i think a lot of it is going to hinge on this public comment period how long it will take to really get through re, um, various reiterations of the, the regulations but then once those regulations are adopted in the legislation it has that the commission has to begin accepting applications within 30 days of adopting those regulations, which is why the whole adoption of the regulations, um, it's gonna hinge, I think, on how much public comment there will be and input um, there will have to be. And I really do encourage everybody to really step into the arena. If you didn't get a chance to really help testify for adult use, this is another opportunity to really let, let your voice be heard and let them know, you know what you need. And we've seen in other markets that even after a bill passes and even after the commission is up and running, it still takes a lot of time for that first license to be issued. Personally, and this is just me guessing, I wouldn't be surprised if it took at least a year, maybe. That would mean I would not be surprised. It would, if, if it happens faster for the first license to be awarded, great. But I think, um, as Jess mentioned, there's an opportunity here to really have your voice heard and make sure that, uh, you know, the commission is able to create regulations and rules that make it accessible and equitable for all. And, yeah. And then obviously the cultivation starts, you know, plants take a little while to grow. Um, so that's something to consider, too. And they still need to give out the licenses from the 2019 request. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. So, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. You know, there we are get, still uh, 24 yeah. licenses up for, you know, that, that are still uh, pending, right? And then they should, these applicants should have really known by December 2019. So we're about, you know, a whole year and a half, really, from them waiting on these licenses. So that still needs to happen. Yeah, what, what and, happened again exactly? I didn't really know that exactly, you know. Ooh. Well, partly there was a lawsuit, which could totally happen again, by the way. Yep. Um, you know, all of these estimates that we're making right now is assuming best case scenario and no one in New Jersey decides to sue to slow down this process. And there's already threats of that. So the chances of there being no lawsuits in my mind is also very slim. Um, but who knows, you know, fingers crossed. That, that held it up for a while in Pennsylvania, in, um, Pennsylvania, in uh, Massachusetts too. America's middle name, man. Yep. <laughs> so, you know, we're gonna, we're, we're looking at a hold up, you know, that's that, they, the winners got released already, yeah? So have they gotten released yet? Yes, no? 
or we oh no wait a minute 40 percent of the applicants got denied or something like that right well what what was what exactly happened with those applications like what's the what's the status right now you know does any anyone have an idea about that i don't know exactly when the winners of the 2019 rfa are going to be announced but really kind of you know for folks who don't know what happened but you know there were a handful of folks who really got rejected based on technical errors um, and so a group of them sued, um, really, you know, saying that it was on the Department of Health's, um, you know, faulty technical systems. Um, the court came down in a very, very anticipated, you know, decision. They only ruled in favor of one applicant, but that was for a bit of a different type of dismissal, not a technical error dismissal. So what this decision came down was they said, hey, Department of Health, you know, you guys were in the right. Hey, um, applicants, you guys had plenty of opportunity and time um, and education around how to submit your application. All that went with it. So what this tells us now is if you are looking to apply for a license, do not wait until the absolute last minute to do so, because now we have precedent. Right now we have precedent that um, all future commissions will be able to rely on. It's basically going to say, you know, if you get rejected because we can't open up your PDF, like that's on you. Yeah. So it was PDFs after all, right? Was that, was that it? Yeah, it was PDFs, man. Honestly, I don't blame them for being mad, but at the same time they told them, right? They did tell them, they warned them beforehand, you know? So Anyone applying, make sure you don't have any PDFs, JPEGs, JPEGs for the win at this point. Um, or just pay. I mean, most, a lot of lawyers I know will literally drive it in a hand deliver paper. That's, I know lawyers that did that um, during that cycle too. Oh, good before idea. this court case. Yeah. They had, a, I know some, at least, at least one person that anticipated this and acted accordingly. <laughs> Man, so has the has the Cannabis Regulatory Commission, the CRC, have they made any indications of when we're going to see these sales start, though? You know, uh, any 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 starting point? Any like, hey, weed? Well, I think what I think what Evan said, right? With uh, as soon as as soon as any of our twelve operators can say, hey, we have enough to meet patient demand, we can really start dispensing adult use cannabis. Um, you know. Yeah, months, definitely towards the end of, of this year, you know, we might be able to see that. So I know that we're estimated, at least I've read it, and I think it was like CNBC or somewhere estimated that the New Jersey market is about 120 million people um, with the surrounding areas and states, um, tourism included, you know, um, in terms of what it could possibly potential potentially hold. I know our supply chain is really only meant to do what, 120, maybe 150, you know what I mean? Like, where's that gap going to be made up though? That's, that's the question I, I really am wondering. Do you see any, any potential even longer holdup because maybe that, that they can't make up the gap that fast, you know? And that's what New York's trying to go for right now. <laughs> this is why there's a race. Yeah, you know, like that's that's always been. I know Cure what Cure Leaf has the the largest um, grow facility in New Jersey, I think, and they're supplying also to other dispensaries. So, you know, it's uh, do do you guys are aware of anyone else or any other company that's starting to get you know started up to to fulfill this need that we have right now? You know, I think they're all hoping to do it. Is my is what I think. I don't know if anyone's actually set up to do it. Yeah. So, and has that, has this legalization impacted, you know, I guess we've talked about the, the surrounding areas, but how are, do you know about anyone in, in Pennsylvania, Delaware, Connecticut, the rest of the tri-state area? How is this affecting legalization across the board? Um, I think it's definitely having a, you know, tremendous impact. I mean, tomorrow I will be um, in can really testifying for in Connecticut um, and helping to advocate, you know, over there. Uh, Jason Ortiz, shout out to Jason Ortiz, who is really leading that movement um, quite successfully. Um, but it's exactly, you know, what we anticipated. We anticipated that as soon as, you know, New Jersey um, legalize that all these states would have to get on board because they don't want their tax dollars flow either, you know, either floating across the Hudson River or going across state lines because, you know, on average, New Jersey would get 100 million visitors, you know, a year um, in terms of, you know, tourism. Obviously, you know, the pandemic um, 
stifled that. But at the same time, we are just, we're in the middle of Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and New York. And so we're really going to be, you know, if we can get this right and get this up and moving quite quickly, I think we'll be, you know, in a good spot. Um, but it seems like, you know, you, New York was definitely not going to let uh, folks take the path over um, and bring cannabis back into their state. Because I know that that's their concern, right, as well. And so how would you enforce that? That is going to be crossing state lines. How is that going to be enforced? I can give a, a little update from Pennsylvania. Um, but, you know, when, in, in a couple of years ago, when, when the conversation was really like heating up between New York, uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, and like who was going to legalize first and, and who was going to move first. Um, Pennsylvania was highly influenced by those conversations. And a couple of years ago, a black senator from Philadelphia had introduced a bill called SB 350, which um, in my opinion was actually one of the one of the best legalization bills that I've read compared to what um, New York and New Jersey were, were currently touting at the time. But now that New Jersey has legalized um, what's happening in Pennsylvania is that we've had the same senator introduce a similar bill. I would say it's a little bit more watered down in language, but he's gotten a co-sponsor who's a Republican. And in Pennsylvania, it's a it's a very red um, red controlled state at the state level. You have even though you do have a governor, new lieutenant governor who is Democrat uh, or Democrats, the um, the legislature is controlled by predominantly Republicans. And so any sort of cannabis legalization conversation that's been going on after medical that it has had to have had at least one or two Republicans vocally publicly saying that they support that. And so now in Pennsylvania, because you have a Republican sponsor co-sponsored adult use bill, um, those conversations are now speeding up. And as, as New York is pushing faster, Pennsylvania certainly doesn't want to get caught out, right? Pennsylvania is a huge agricultural state as well. So there's a lot of opportunities for farming. There's a lot of opportunities for tourism too. And Philadelphia, you know, one of the largest cities on the East Coast, mm -hmm. um, it's right across from Camden. So there's a lot of conversations happening in Philly on how are we going to handle people who literally drive across the bridge get their weed and then come back because uh, that's going to be a, a pretty quick issue um, if New Jersey moves everything at a, you know, good pace. So Pennsylvania is moving fast, folks. The domino effect is happening and uh, you can see the ripple effects so easily right now. And I believe today uh, one of the, the bills that uh, Jason Ortiz helped push through just got um, voted um, out of committee as well. So it looks like that's also moving. And I actually just got um, a text today um, from my friend uh, Chelsea down in Virginia, who's really trying to spearhead for social equity, who actually, she told me, she said, you know, that their governor is looking to now legalize possession um, of cannabis. And she said legislators kept saying we needed New Jersey. So she said, actually, thank you for New Jersey, because that's what they really, you know, were looking to. So it's not even just like, you know, a tri-state area. It's really what we're looking to well on the East Coast. I, I mean, just to echo this and like add my story to that, I lobby in New York and New Jersey. I was a registered lobbyist in New York for a while and I got one of the pens used to sign the medical law there. And I had a bunch of legislators, staffers contact me, ask me what they could learn about New Jersey. Um, it is very much happening right now, those conversations because of New Jersey. Man, this is this is incredible. You know, we're looking at this huge domino effect started from the Garden State, you know, at least here on the East Coast and like moving forward, you know, and it's just like, you know, to kind of wrap this up, you know what I mean? What roles, you know, can we all play to continue bringing this equitable industry, you know, to New Jersey and really to, you know, if people are listening in from other areas to their hometowns, you know, to their home estates. So I think, um, on that, uh, one thing that even just folks here, if they're living either in a town um, that is looking to prohibit cannabis operations, um, to let your city officials know that while they can ban cannabis operations, they can't ban the delivery of cannabis into their municipalities, mm -hmm. right? And so that's actually going to be a very good um, point for you to make when you're talking to these city officials of like, yeah, listen, if you don't want them in here, your constituents are still going to be consuming. Delivery is still going to, delivery is not going to be more robust in here, but hey, guess what? You're going to basically be forfeiting the 2% tax revenue to your municipality by not allowing these cannabis operations. So I think having that um, in the bill is really going to um, persuade and motivate a lot of these towns um, who are still really caught up in the whole reefer madness um, process. 
propaganda to really allow these um, operations in. And I just think for folks outside of New Jersey who are looking to advocate in their state um, is you don't really have to reinvent the wheel. Um, there's a lot of us who have been doing the work, um, you know, folks have been doing it for a lot longer, you know, than I have, and I've watched and observed and I talked to a lot of folks about really what needs to be done. Um, because really what happens in other states is going to affect what happens here, right? We are years behind on the West Coast, but the, the issues that we saw and even the issues we saw in Massachusetts are going to pervade in New Jersey as well if we don't learn from them. So I would say for folks to really take heed of what happened in other states, Take that evidence and use it as leverage to really um, persuade, you know, your city officials, your state officials as to history repeats itself constantly. And the fact that we recycle so much of the same language in terms of legislation and regulations from other states, mm -hmm. a lot of the same issues we're going to see here in New Jersey. We had delays because of lawsuits. So did every other state. Right. And so that should, that may just continue happening if we don't learn. Um, so I think the best thing that people can do right now is, educate themselves, not on what's happening in their state, but in other states, um, and then really start educating their communities. And that starts out with your family. So if you can get your family on board, you can get a whole bunch of people on board. So I have one major question that we should be having touched on. I know we're gonna get, we're gonna light up, but what's up with expungements and people in jail, right? What happens to people with, the, with that stuff on their record? You know, and we're talking about equity and wanting to help people. And that's something that we got to correct moving forward. So I'm curious to know what, what the law says about that. Um, I could touch. So the law will let some people out of jail and uh, off probation and parole early as, well, I didn't even know what this was called an operation as an operation of law, which I didn't even know was a thing. The, um, it's not going to let everyone out. So we are working on trying to uh, get more pardons um, with the governor's office. We submitted a proposal um, uh, that Jess's name was on um, and Is it? Did he freeze? The big freeze. Yeah, if Jess, you want to continue where Evan or oh, will pop back in when she's <laughs> back. Oh, well, well, let's see. Let's let's wait for for Evans. I know that this was his like uh, his brainchild. I know he did and, a lot of yes. I would say with we, we is NJ normal uh, or normal, normal. Yeah, I mean, the thing with expungement so is that there was an expungement bill passed, I believe it was in 2019, that wasn't cannabis specific, but did speak to certain types, right? Um, and so that there are going to be that, but for folks who don't understand, like, New Jersey has one of the most onerous expungement processes in the country. Um, and so, you know, in terms of, you know, how it would be done, right, is that now would be sort of online. It would, it's not going to be automatic the way that we want it, but it's still going to be, you know, an online process, something. Um, but I still think that there's too, way too much of the burden um, on the petitioner to have to go through all of that, because in order for you to get expunged, like, it's not just like one agency, you got to go to like, five different governing bodies to really, you know, fully get it expunged. Um, but, you know, for folks that do have certain cannabis related offenses, um, you will not be precluded from applying for licenses um, as well. But if you have been convicted of like fraud or embezzlement or something that has to do with truthfulness and honesty like that, that's going to be up to the discretion of the commission, whether or not they deem you rehabilitated or not. But if it is cannabis related offenses, um, I believe it, it's only up to a certain amount. Um, and I kind of forgot the number, so I can't give exactly that. Um, however, you know, I would definitely check to, to make sure um, both in the decrim bill and the adult use bill what that is. Um, but there is language explicitly stating that those with felonies and criminal records related to cannabis will not be excluded if it falls, you know, under a certain amount. I think it was even up to like 25 pounds. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty large. Um, and that's actually, you know, a pretty solid avenue for folks to go into. Evan, you're back. Sorry about that. I heard you say big freeze. I was like, I'm frozen? What? I, I'm <laughs> I, I was going to also say you're crash. talking about we, so just let everybody know for context who we is in terms of getting those pardons and doing that work. Um, so was that to me? Yes. Sorry. Um, there was a whole coalition. Um, I helped write a proposal with the ACLU's assistance 
um, and we had like 15 or 20 organizations sign on to endorse. Um, there's ACLU, NAACP, Normal, um, MPP, um, Salvation Social Justice. Jess was on there as an individual. Minorities for Medical Marijuana signed out as an organization. Um, Latino Action Network, a bunch of uh, really solid organizations. Um, and we have some additional things planned as well. But the law is uh, actually decent at that, um, but it doesn't get everyone out of prison. Important. So we can talk about maybe next steps, but I, I just wanted to also encourage everybody. This is, this is about to be Q&A time. So please, if you have questions, send those to the chat now. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, then I'm going to go back to being quiet. Um, what the question I was going to ask was just about also like community and reinvestment with taxes. Where's tax money going from this? We see a lot of places like uh, I think it was Colorado and another state recently where tax money from cannabis actually outsold uh, alcohol this time around. So we're starting to see, you know, the popularity of cannabis in different states. So where's the money going from taxes and how can this potentially help communities if it's not already doing so? Yeah, so um, the way that the cannabis tax revenue, so for folks who are not under, don't know what the tax rate is, right? The way that we voted on it was that it would be the sales tax plus a 2% um, municipality tax. So I know there's a lot of folks saying like, oh, it's only gonna be 8.625 we're going to have the lowest in the country. Um, but that may not actually be the case because municipalities can actually tack on. So if you're at the cultivation level, if you have a cultivation and processing, 2%, 2%, you know, there, while that may not end up on your receipt, that's going to somehow find its way really into, you know, that price as well. But the way that it is broken down is taxes, you know, there's a portion of it that's going to go towards overseeing the commission and all of its offices and duties. Um, a portion of it will go to police for law enforcement or training. A part of it then uh, will go, uh, I believe, um, I forgot, I think it was like 70% will go to social equity programs as well to municipalities that are deemed as impact zones. And these impact zones are municipalities with you know, high unemployment rates, high incarceration rates for cannabis, disproportionate arrests. There's a few other um, criteria you know, within that, um, but the tax revenue then will funnel over to these municipalities to enact these sort of programs, right? And then there is um, a social equity excise fee. Can't call it a tax because we didn't vote on it, um, but it's a fee. Um, and that's up to the discretion of the commission. So if the commission wants to enact a cultivation social equity excise fee, it's going to be at the cultivation level. And then 100% of that tax revenue would go to social equity programs for an undefined term um, of people from socially and economically disadvantaged communities, whatever that means, um, but to impact zones. And so municipalities are gonna have an enormous amount of discretion and power over these tax revenues, which is why it is enormously important for you to start engaging with your city officials, start attending those town meetings, those town halls, start letting them know who you are and getting involved just because of how much um, money they're really going to you know, be taking in. And we do wanna make sure that the money that they are taking in um, is actually going towards these programs and these really actually great programs that are contemplated in the bill. Dear. As long as it gets implemented properly right <laughs> which is sometimes a big if but and you know just to just to reiterate what jess said like this is an opportunity to get involved you can get involved in this right now um especially at the municipal level the fact that the money is going to be allocated at the municipal level um that's pretty big um for better or worse and so if you do not know your local elected officials in your town in your county etc this is a good opportunity to reach out and say hello. And with that, we're going to lead into the question and answer portion of it. So for the audience, you guys have some questions for anyone up here, you know, just throw them in the chat uh, real quick, you know, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll go in the order we, that we can, you know, we'll see, we'll see what's going on here. So uh, can a, a town ban all the licenses or services? Um, I'm going to say if you guys want to just pick and choose actually which ones you, you think you want to attack, you know what I mean? There's, it seems to be a lot. Uh, I know the one from Jackie mentioning the, the town banning businesses and then 
um the view of tourism someone wants to know is the view of tourism with cannabis in the summer stuff like that so i guess a good example would be like atlantic city you know what i mean how could how could cannabis impact somewhere like there so just i'm going to just say quickly because i know jackie's question just came first and i think i answered it already so yes municipalities can ban all cannabis operations but they cannot ban the delivery of cannabis or cannabis products in their municipalities that's one thing and then as for how it's going to affect tourism, especially during the summer at the shore, Atlantic City is a hot spot. A lot of people are going to want to be um, in Atlantic City. I do believe it is also deemed an impact zone as well. And so that's also, um, you know, because 25% of licenses are going to have to go to impact zones. Um, so I think, it, I think, you know, Atlantic City is going to be definitely a and whether you know folks in certain beach towns want to um i think that's just really going to depend on the ordinances that are put forth so it's really hard to speak because right now we don't really know what towns are going to do atlantic city also has been asking for this as a municipality for a long time i remember going and meeting with the mayor at the time, like eight years ago or seven years ago, and they were all over this from the get go. Um, so my guess is that they will probably be putting even some dollars into it. Um, obviously, it's going to depend on when other places go. Yeah, I mean, there's still Vegas. Vegas is legal. So we kind of they were hoping I know Atlantic City was initially hoping to beat Vegas that happened that we failed at that a long time ago. Um, but there can also be other business opportunities, you know, like I, uh, I uh, a partner, a partner in uh, Emerald Farm Tours out in California. We're not a cannabis company, but we bring people to cannabis companies. Um, and that's a whole business opportunity where you actually you know, don't need a license. There's much less risk associated with. Uh, and that's actually, in my opinion, a great opportunity uh, for people who want to get in the industry, but you know, may uh, be sort of smart enough to want to reduce your risk at this point or not have the, the risk appetite. Yeah, you know, um, so I, we'll move on to uh, Catherine, uh, Catherine, Catherine Hernandez has a question. She's uh, asking about the licensing for um, work for edible companies, you know, a cannabis based edible company products and has the legislation maxed the dosage limit, which is a good question. You know, have they put a cap on how much THC is going to be allowed in certain products? How many can have, how much can have, what the cannabinoid limit would be? So in terms of, for edibles, that's that's a processing. Like, so if you want to actually convert, you know, raw material into, you know, a tincture or a brownie or something, that's going to be take form in the form of a processing license, right? And then if you want to sell it, that takes the form of a retail license. So anything that is going to touch the plant is going to need a license. But it is important to know that you're not going to be able to just get all these types of licenses at one time. The state is coupling them in a way. So if you want, if you want to get a cultivation, you can get a processing, but you can't get a retail one. There's a two-year ban. <clears throat> ban on it. If you want to get a wholesale, you can only get a distribution license. Um, the purpose is they kind of want to get away from the vertical model. So it's also really important for you all to know, because um, I know I sometimes get folks who are like, I want to apply for, you know, six of these. And I have to tell them, well, you're only going to be able to get two um, at the most. So we have to really narrow in to see which two um, you really want and which ones you're actually going to be able to apply for. Um, so that's in terms of uh, dosage, I'm not so sure if they place a sort of cap on it. I do know that there is language as to how much can be within an individual serving. And I believe it's somewhere between like five to 10 milligrams, which I think is pretty standard um, around the country. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking into the bill right now. I'm, I'm trying to see if there's actual dosage uh, language in there, because I think that that's a really good question. And that's going to be important, too. But I'll check back because I'm looking at the bill right now. Yeah. Um, and then so check back with us on that. And for the last question, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, is real estate required to apply for retail licenses? I, I yes. think yes. There, there, is, there is going to be there's a portion um, on the application, at least historically, this is how it's been because we don't have a current um, licensing round. But they did require some sort of site control, right? So whether that came through a lease, whether that came through a deed, whether that came through a letter of intent, where um, you're not actually um, committing to it, but you are going to need to show some form of site control. But one thing that is really important that you are going to most likely have to show 
is sort of, if you are renting it, you're going to have to show a certification from your landlord that they understand that it is for a cannabis product or a cannabis sort of operation. Um, but once again, you know, if you fall within under the, um, the requirements for a conditional license and you may not have real estate, but you have everything else, um, right, then real estate might not be um, necessary at the time of applying, but you'll have a certain amount of time before you have to do so. Okay. And that's interesting with uh, California though. I mean, thank you, Jess. And, you know, we're going to wrap this up now, guys, you have any final words, you know, want to go around, say any last words, everybody. I'll say one thing um, in terms of, uh, you know, what people can also be doing now um, really read. Like I, I have to say that, um, that I, I, I hope that people that are interested in becoming, you know, a part of the industry come in with an understanding and a consciousness is why we're getting involved. Right? There are people who are literally locked up for a plant that should have never been illegal or prohibited in the first place, and they're not going to have the opportunity to participate, or they're going to have a very hard time entering this market. And so I'm hoping that people, you know, two books that I would say, New Jim Crow, read that book as a starter, and then also read the book Smoke Signals by Martin Lee, which is a really good book and talks about the history of marijuana prohibition. If you don't understand the history of this plant, if you don't understand the history really of the drug war. Um, you know, I fear that people are gonna be entering this market without understanding what the impact is and why they should be participating and how they should be helping others. So really read, really understand the, the history of cannabis because that's gonna make you a more under, like just empathetic person to the cause. And also I think it'll help people become more allies in supporting these equity measures. Um, I would definitely echo that. You know, this industry would not exist if it wasn't for a social movement. Like no one did all this work to create an, in I mean, very few people did all this work to create an industry. It was for the social purpose, uh, decades of volunteers um, doing free work. Um, and then the only thing I would say is that, you know, it's not like cannabis is legal, advocates job is done. And now, you know, people who want to make money have their opportunity. Like the, the work is going to be consistently evolving. We talked about just some of the things that need to be improved. More things will come up. Um, it's going to be difficult to implement this properly. You know, passing the law is very difficult. Implementing it is sometimes more difficult. Um, we've noticed around the country. So, you know, don't just assume that you can't be an advocate and you can just make money. Um, that's, I mean, you could try, but uh, we're not going to get far uh, as a group, as a community, if if we have that mentality. And uh, my final thoughts um, for everybody is uh, thanks for, for definitely spending, uh, you know, seven o'clock on a Thursday night with us as part of you investing um, in your education. Um, and so I would say, you know, definitely echoing Tahid and Evan, right? Like definitely educate yourself, get involved, step into the arena um, as well. And then my last thought is really is to please make sure that you do your due diligence on who you plan on working with. And that's going to stem from your partners to your professional services um, as well. Just make sure because right now folks are really seeing this as a huge money grab. There is a certain thing, right, called the green tax where everything is much more expensive simply for the fact that it can be because this is going to be such a high demand you know, industry. So if you are looking to work with individuals and you are looking to partner up with folks like do not take what they say, you know, at face value, really dig in, really do your due diligence um, just because of how hard and how expensive it is it going to be to, you know, really apply for this sort of license. And it's much easier to catch all these issues now than it really is down the road. Because right now, everybody's best friends, everybody's in the same boat right now, we're all excited and everything like that. All of that changes. And when people are like, no, it's not, it's not going to change. I always tell them, like, then I would be out of a job. Lawyers would be out of a job if shit wasn't going wrong. Um, so just please make sure um, that you really take the time to educate yourself so that you understand what it is you're getting involved with. And then educate yourself on who you plan on getting involved with. Well put, well said, you know, um, thank you for everyone for coming out today. You know, I think the biggest takeaway from all of this is educate yourself. You know, that's why we're all here today, right? Education, to be able to spread that knowledge and awareness to other people, you know, and to help get this through, you know, so we have legalization done correctly. And I think that's the biggest thing, you know, we want legalization, but we want it correctly. And we want to make sure that it's fair, you know, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Nadir, 
thank you. Thank the rest of the smart team for putting this together. Dan, uh, Danny, where'd, he, where'd they go? So yeah, you know, every, thank everyone so much and uh, have a good night, everyone. You know, I don't know if they end this or.